So, um, how many of you were familiar with the ONSI corpus before this paper? Is that something you've heard about before, or one one hand? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Great. Okay. So actually. All of this links back, in fact, right to when I was a master's student at MUN, because when I finished up my first year, Sandra Clark was hosting the Methods in Dialectology Conference, which just happened to be in St. John's that year. And that was also the year when the ONSI project was sort of, um, it had like its, it had its public release. And Elizabeth Gordon and Peter Treadgill and all the other folks involved in the project were at that conference and they were talking about this amazing corpus that they put together and I remember sitting in the audience and thinking oh my god to work on that would be a dream like how great would that be but it's never gonna happen I'm never gonna I'm never gonna be in New Zealand uh, so when I had a chance to go for a job there <laughs> I jumped at it because this corpus is so exciting. I mean, since ONSI came out, other people have been trying to construct these types of diachronic corpora, but this was really the first and the most important because it was so critical for looking at new dialect formation. So the reason I did this paper sort of goes all the way back to first hearing about the corpus and thinking about the possibilities that it allowed. Specifically why I did quotatives was because uh, I have a long-term interest in quotatives and um, as I talk about in the paper, there's been a really big emphasis on synchronic apparent time studies and if we think about it, um, when we think about variation as sociolinguistics, a lot of the time what we go to immediately is apparent time. But of course the method also works for real time and I had such a great opportunity to take a look at the system as a whole instead of just focusing on be like, right? Because I think what we assume is that, well, be like's this awesome innovation, we all, we all use it, don't even try to pretend you don't. We all love it, don't even try to pretend you don't. Uh, and I think that we assume that the system had to simply react to be like. And I think a lot of us just worked from that position. And I wanted to see if that really was the case, right? Like, was there all kinds of stability, and then boom, be like hit? Or was there other stuff going on, and then be like just happened to come into the picture? So that's where all of this started. A, I could do it. B, I wanted to. And C, there were bigger questions that I could address. Awesome. Uh, right, and so it looks like you, um, the, the, the data sets that you have available, the corporate they have available allows you to do that really nicely. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things with that set is that, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's all there, right? It's all transcribed. It was all already made ready for me. So what I needed to do was go in myself and with a couple of research assistants and just start systematically going through all of it. So. I mean, that's the, that work is the result of a lot of RA hours. <laughs> I was going to say, it's, this is, uh, I think you said 4,500 tokens. Yeah. Um, okay. That's the big, one of the largest counts to date for uh, quotatives, a study of quotatives. Um, how many hours did it take? I don't even know. <laughs> Honestly, I, I can honestly say hundreds. Yeah. Okay. Right? I mean, I put, I put in easily, um, I know I put in at least 100 myself, and then I had two RAs who uh, worked really extensively on that corpus with me as well. So pro honestly, probably 300, 400 hours of extraction and initial coding, and then I went through and added a bunch of coding on my own, and then um, checked all of their coding. Yeah. yeah. So it was a it was a huge investment. Yeah, for sure. And um, did you have an idea of what you're going to be coding for? I know I th I know you've been doing work in this area for years, and and mm -hmm. uh, and you know the literature uh, extensively. But were there new things that that you came across in this um, that you didn't know you're going to be coding for initially? I s okay. So one of the things I started doing with this corpus. Um, 
was really paying attention to whether or not there was an addressee, which was something I hadn't done before. Uh, and I started paying attention to where the verb was. So that was something we'd always kind of done, right, with say. So the difference between I said, wow, as opposed to um, wow, is what, wow, he said which is actually not a real token, you would never come across that. But anyway, um, I started paying attention to that because the historical data, <laughs> I hate saying this, but it was so boring to code because it was all say. Everything was speech yeah. and everything was say. And so it started to feel really dull and repetitive, so we started to notice these other things in a way that we really hadn't noticed them before. And that's when we started to get excited, and we thought maybe these things were doing things that they, that they don't really do anymore because you had so few resources at your disposal. And it turned out they weren't all that interesting, actually, in the end. But those were two things that, that come to mind right away. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the data shows how, how boring it must have been. Uh, <laughs> first, the first, oh yeah, on page 351, the uh, table three, um, all the things that you couldn't look at, you couldn't model in, in Goldbar, um, there's one, two, three, four, four, four factor groups out of your seven. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because there was nothing going on. Right. So, uh, and this is, okay, and then, so the table itself is just for the use of say, um, the, what was, 89%. And then the next one, the next highest uh, marker was uh, zero quoted, it was at 8%. So, yeah, uh, there's probably not enough in there to, to even do an internal analysis on zero. No, I mean, I played around with it, but there was, there just wasn't enough, so I didn't feel, I, there was so much I wanted to put in the paper, so what you guys should know is that this paper, the original submission, was twice as long. Uh. It was, it was a beast, it was big, there was a lot um, that I thought that was interesting, and I can't even, I should have gone back and looked at that paper, but I haven't, but I know there was a bunch of stuff I had to take out. Okay. Because right. it was it was too much, right? The editor said, "Yeah, but you need to cut it in half." Mm -hmm. It was a sixty-page manuscript the first time it went in. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, the the part that um, I mean, we can all talk about our favorite parts and our favorite pages and favorite favorite graphs and tables. Uh, but the the focus on and the the emergence of uh, mimesis throughout the corpora is something that um, I'm particularly interested in because um, we hear it all the time now. People uh, make up their own voices for people they're quoting all the time, but when did that start? Okay, so it's it's there anyways, right? I mean, it was it's it's constant. It's a constant presence in those older data. Uh, it just wasn't doing a lot of work. I mean, there's this one great quote where a woman quotes a parrot. So she, <laughs> there, there, there was a, uh, a talking parrot that someone in the village had, and they um, had a woman in a wheelbarrow, and they were taking her off in the wheelbarrow to jail for public drunkenness. <laughs> she was in the wheelbarrow because she couldn't talk, and um, I mean, she was blind, drunk. And the parrot says something, and, the, and you know, the woman, it, as she voices the parrot, she, she does that prototypical, you know, I mean, she isn't saying, Polly wants a cracker, but she's doing that kind of voice effect. So it's there all along, um, but what you can see is that um, it's, it's the only verb it can really do anything for is say, and it's not actually a, a robust effect within the data, right? Like it just, it just isn't actually a significant um, determinant, and it isn't until we get into um, sort of the the mid twentieth century that we can see mimesis starting to partition uh, different verbs so that it becomes a significant predictor. So it was always in the system. It was just it it was like it was this resource that people had, but it wasn't differentiating between different verbs and different modes. 
the way that it does now. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, so I'm looking at the very first uh, table, table three, uh, yeah. that mimesis was already there, al always there. Uh, 184 out of uh, 544. So that just gives you a set, if I have the numbers right. Yeah. So it's a, so it's a small amount of uh, of the tokens with uh, that that correspond to say. Right. Um, would did would you find that most of the most of the say tokens were just using um, like kind of verbatim speech? Like here's what you said without any adding any like uh, flair or or uh, color. Okay. So, yeah, so just sort of m modal, <laughs> if you will. I mean, yeah, right. most of it was that. I sorry, I I was shaking my head no on verbatim because quotation, no matter what the verb is, it's it's hardly ever verbatim. Sure, right. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, most of it, it would it, you didn't get any noticeable change in voice quality, in pitch. In um, intensity, they weren't doing accents. I mean, people now really like to do accents. It doesn't matter if they do them well or not. Um, yeah. None of that stuff was there. It was very, if I can say this, it was very flat. Uh -huh. they, so you knew it was quoted speech because of the syntax and because of the verb. Right. And yeah. because of, say, like the dialectic references and the pronouns within the quoted content. but. You d you had far fewer signals in the sense that you know yeah as I said mimesis was there but it wasn't nearly as frequent. Right, and yeah. now is that, is that because of the nature of the recordings? It was so maybe if you want to tell us a little bit about the mobile unit, like what what was the the goal behind it? What were the circumstances or the environment in which the interviews were done? Sure. Okay. I always actually like to preface this by saying that I think the mobile unit data is better in many in many respects than the contemporary stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's it's better now. Of course, the sound quality isn't as good, right? Because they had those big um, reel to reel recorders, so it was the New Zealand Broadcasting Service literally in 1946 and 1948 loaded up those big reel-to-reel -reel recording devices in a van and drove around New Zealand um, to small towns on both the North and the South Island looking for uh, people who had been uh, born and raised in the colony to find out about life growing up in a colonial context because this was the first generation of native-born Kiwis. So they wanted um, stories. They literally were asking people for their stories, what are the things that happened to you growing up in a colony? That sounds like a great resource. And I know Mun has a collection of Herbert Halpert recordings that uh, essentially did that too. I think he loaded up a recorder in his car yeah. um, and, and, and wandered around, uh, around Newfoundland. Um, yeah. Essentially the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, because some of the stuff that you get, I mean, yeah, you're getting these sort of fabled storytellers in their communities, right? I mean, part of it, they were saying, who are the good storytellers? Because the whole purpose was to put these stories on air, on Radio NZ. Uh, so they wanted people who were entertaining. Uh, but what you end up with, you don't actually have very polished um, practice stories in the sense that they're not fluid, right? They still have all of that spontaneous speech stuff going on in them, so lots of repetition, lots of pauses, lots of clearing the throat, lots of ums and ahs, all that stuff is still there. Um, but they managed to avoid <laughs> those bad interview contexts, the most part, right? So, because anyone who's done field work, you know, you're going to have one day where you're just like, that interview was awesome, that was great, and you can kind of forget that, yes, it's you, but it also is the person you're interviewing. Because then you go the next day and you interview someone else, and it's just plain hard work. Oh, yeah. And they didn't have a lot of those in the mobile unit because they were specifically looking for people who had stories. Right? Instead of saying, we're just going to sit down and talk for a little while and, and trying to steer someone into a story, that was the whole purpose of these. So the data are really good. They're really vernacular. They're entertaining. They're funny. They're heartbreaking. They're, they're, they're just good quality materials. Yeah. Are they better storytellers than Newfoundlanders? 
No, no, not possible. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so they, so I'm just wondering, going back to the uh, the question I asked before, stuff about the mobile unit. Is it? Oh, yeah. Is it? So, to what to what extent do you think the data that came out of the recordings, um, and it's probably the case that is it's a it's a reflection of the circumstances. So. Um, they were strangers talking to strangers, really. Right. Does that have any effect on on the type of auditives that you're, you're going to get out? Um, I don't think so. I mean, in a sense, I would say less so than in a traditional sociolinguistic interview. Less than, okay. Yeah, for the same reasons that I just said, right? Because these are people who were there to tell a story, and um, I mean, for me, I know when I listen to my students' field work, I'm going through those recordings and I'm looking for narratives and I'm looking to see direct quotation. And the more of it I see, the more I feel that they've managed to really set somebody at ease because uh, recording is, speech reporting anyways, or thought reporting is necessarily performative, right? It's all about drama and you can't do that at least you don't do it as much if you're not feeling comfortable, right? I've told the same story a lot of different ways, and the more quotation I use, the more involved I actually am. Right. So um, I, I, I think proportionally we had, um, did I include that? I think I looked at this. I think there was actually, per word count, I think this is one of the things I had to take out. There was more quotation by word count in the... Um, in the older materials than there were in the more recent materials. Okay. For me, that's a really poor indicator. I hate that kind of indicator. But for me, it just sort of shows that, yeah, they really did get people to just sit down and tell stories and get involved, as opposed to the newer stuff that has a lot of meta-commentary and non-narrative interaction. Right. Were the, were the newer recordings done by students at the university? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I found, I found even when I was doing my own uh, field work for my master's, uh, the, the people wanted to like wax poetic about uh, different things that were happening in the community rather than talking about telling me particular stories. They wanted yeah. to get an analysis of everybody in their high school or who they hung out with and all the different uh, groups without necessarily getting into the details, the nitty gritty details that we're all after. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's right. I mean, when we did all the Victoria projects, it was really hard to get people to tell stories, and some of the field workers were more um, successful than others at steering people away from just sort of blah, blah, blah to actually telling a story, right? It, it's hard to get people in a narrative mode, right? You, well, you know, tell me about, you know, when your first child was born or when you got married or how did you meet your wife? Oh, well, a friend set us up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Whereas these old stores, oh well, let me tell you, and then and you get a narrative out of them. Yeah. Well, it was more common in that time period, also. Like storytelling was an entertainment. It yeah. was nowadays more people are watch TV versus tell stories to everybody in the household. So it's not as common unless you're maybe from a town. Or, I don't know. I wonder if technology plays a, a role there as well, though. Like, if you relied on stories when you were uh, a young person in the early 1900s or late 1800s, not only for the sharing of stories, but also you relied on oral histories um, and, and oral information for the sharing of important information as well, where you maybe didn't have a, a radio in your community yet, maybe you didn't have a newspaper, you certainly didn't have a television. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, too. Yeah. I mean, even the nature of um, family di dynamics is changing, right? Because I used to tell my students, well, like, because we talk about storytelling as a way of, of, of capturing cultural recreation and learning norms. And for me, I know, growing up, we sat down every night at the dinner table to eat together as a family, seven nights a week, and storytelling was a big part of what went on. And when I asked my students about this, Every year, less and less of them actually have this memory of the real time being a big family time when you all sat down together. And so I think that it's harder to find. 
for a lot of reasons, and one of them is because our, our, cult, our cultural norms are changing, right? One of the places where we could count on um, the learning of storytelling skills and the reproduction of storytelling skills is being eroded by our changing lifestyles. So that, that's just for me. I have no science to back that up. <laughs> you would never want to put that in a paper, but that's an impression that I have as well. Right. No, I'm, I'm sure there's something to it. Um, I mean, not not to sound grumpy and old, but like yeah. the storytellings are through Twitter now. The, uh, yeah. the message. Um, Tell me in 140 characters. I don't have five minutes. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and not everybody. And I'm sure it wasn't the case back then um, that everybody was had to get the gab and were exceptional storytellers. Uh, I'm sure a few stood out the way they do now. Um, but perhaps the oral communication was was uh, a little more um, significant uh, mm -hmm. to the to the community, to the culture, and what yeah. we now it is, in a certain way. Yeah. yeah. But no, those the mobile unit materials are absolutely fabulous. I I, I, I love them. They're just fun to listen to, uh, and the stories are great. It's kind of like a, a modern day or a, a, a the, the prototype to the story core projects that are out now um, in New York City and even across uh, you know, a number of different cities and states. You can um, go into a, a mobile studio and record a story or record a conversation with a friend or a, a, a parent or a grandparent. Uh, and just it's a, it's an oral history project and the idea is to archive these stories for uh, future generations. Yeah. So I wonder if like you could compare if it would be a good comparison of, say, like if they have something like this in modern times in New Zealand, um, uh, a baby uh, initiative by the by the radios radio broadcasters, um, where you can compare those recordings with the uh, mobile unit recordings, and if there'd be more of a parity between the, the type of data that's collected. Yeah, right. yeah. So, you do have that, right? You guys can go online. You can watch the Quake Box. Oh, okay. The, the Quake Box is, I think it's actually a shipping container that they've set up uh, in downtown Christchurch uh, where people go in. You literally go and you sit in the box and there's a, a recording device in front of you and you tell your story about living through the two big earthquakes. Oh, very cool. Right? I mean, because the city's still recovering from those. So in a sense, those are very much oral histories Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that are on par with what you get in the mobile unit. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, I'm actually not, one of the things I found with those data is that in a sense, the variable controls the comparability of the materials because where all those quotatives happen is in narrative, right. which is a really specific style. They're in complicating action of narrative. So there's a lot of those other, that other kind of talk, right, that we're talking about is irrelevant because that's not where these quotes are happening anyway. Yeah, sure. Right? So the, 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 the variable itself sort of imposes a control in that sense because the data are, by their very nature, um, it's the same kind of talk. Now, are the stories as long? Generally, no. Right? But, uh, and you don't get as many from individual speakers. But at least it is all narrative. So in that sense, uh, I felt comfortable with the comparison. Yeah. Great. Anybody else have any uh, anything they can pipe in any time with uh, any questions you might have, or it can be on topic or even off topic. <laughs> um, I'll I'll ask another question. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, I, I, this is more of a technical statistics question than, um, and it probably has a very short and simple answer. Um, you used a goal bar for looking at, um, for teasing out the, the effects of different factors on uh, the use of different vari uh, vari variables, like say and be like and so on. Um, did you use I? There's, I, well, where is it here? Uh, somewhere on page, you know, maybe it's a different page. Uh, 
354, you're, uh, yeah, you're looking across corpora at, at the increase in first-person recording. So is that is that a chi-square test that you did there? Yes. Okay. See, I thought it was short, short and simple. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Um, I, I can actually speak to the stats if you're interested because there's, there's another there's a lot of background to this paper, um, which is that the first time I I drafted this, um, I had I'd been talking to Joe Sammons, who's the editor of Diachronica, and he really wanted me to give him something. So I was three quarters of the way through writing this paper, and I said, Joe, I've been writing this thinking I'm submitting it to you, but now I'm not sure it's actually right. So I sent him this draft, right? Like it was just for him, just so he could glance through it and. He looked at it, and as it turns out, he sent it to the entire junta, the entire editorial board. So, and they all looked at it, and they said, yes, we would like you to submit it. So I did. So the first time it went in, it went to Diachronica, and it sat with them for five months. And what happened is that two of the reviewers, you could tell, were variationists, and they had no problem whatsoever with the statistics. And then it went to a non-variationist who really wanted me to be running mixed effects and all those types of things. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. And so Joe said, can you redo the stats? Yeah. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I said no um, is be I had a number of reasons. The, the biggest reason was that I wanted something that was comparable to what, to all that other quotative research that was out there, right? So if you're going to be saying, hey, no, it's not just be like, there's these bigger things going on, I really wanted the stats, the model to be the same, Right, so that we knew we were comparing like with like. Right. So that was number one. The second one is that I disagreed with the point that the mixed effects were going to give us something better because of all the work I've been involved in where we've run it both ways, um, Goldfarb has given us the same thing. It's just how it presents the results. Okay. But I find the mixed effects often are harder to interpret. Um, so I didn't want to do that. And then... Um, the third reason was that um, I, I really felt that I had justified what I'd done already, um, and so I, I didn't I didn't do that. The bigger problem is that with those other types of statistical modeling, see the difference. The, the one thing Goldvar has that all those other things don't have is it has that don't count condition, right? So that within a factor group, I can say. Look, for grammatical person, I only want you to consider first and third because those are the biggies that have always been implicated and there's no existing claim for second persons, right? So if I now include second persons in the run, I'm adding a third thing that's necessarily going to affect how the other things come out. But I can't, in mixed effects, say for grammatical person, I just want you to consider first versus third. I actually have to cut all second person data out of the data set completely. So that's a huge chunk of data that actually just disappears from the whole analysis and not just from one piece of it. Right. That, that ties back to my point about I wanted to make sure we were comparing the same thing so that I could really safely say this is a bigger thing than just be like. Yeah. Right? So that was a hard decision though, right? I mean, because Diachronic is a fabulous venue. I, I respect Joe Salmon's immensely. I would have loved to have had the paper there, but you know, my, my place was no, and his place was, well, if you don't do it, we can't publish it. Oh, wow. Well. Um, so, and you know, fair enough. So I turned around and sent it to Language Variation and Change, and I sent the full reviews I would received already from Language, which I would already done all the revisions they would asked for, apart from the stats. Um, and so I sent all that to Rena, told her what I had done, and then within a couple of months, you know, I had the go-ahead from, from LBC. She just wanted me to cut it in half. <laughs> so, so I had to shorten it, but the, the core substance remained the same. But so statistics are an interesting question when it comes to this kind of work, right? And, and what, you, what you can and can't do. Uh, and for me, comparability was really, really important, which isn't to say that those other things aren't good. They're fabulous. They're really great, in fact. Um, but... It, it wasn't the right package to use for something like quotatives if you want to do like with like. Sure, right. So for uh, on that note, then, so what 
so for those that, that aren't familiar with mixed effects modeling, what, what is, yeah. that, is that used for? What is that good for? Well, actually, mixed effects would have been great here because what it, um, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you've, I don't think I can add anything that you haven't already told them, but um, what Goldvarb does is it assumes that everything has a fixed effect, so it's not going to pay attention to, say, individuals in your sample. Or it's not going to pay attention to, say, um, individual birth years, right? Instead, you kind of have to group everybody, right? So I can't say, well, this person was born in 19, or 1851, but this person was born in 1852. Rather, I have to say, let's look at everybody born in the 1850s, and let's look at everybody born in the 1860s, right? right? So it, you don't get those types of continuous variables, and you can't say, take birth year into effect, right? You can you just have to find different ways to group the data. And I think that would have been I think that would have been really um, useful. It just would have it would have changed some of the claims I could make be, because of all the data I was gonna have to cut out essentially and model differently. And not not to mention rebuilding a whole new data set too. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been all set. It's a huge it's a monster of a file. Yeah. Uh, the last thing you want to do is go through it and adapt it for another statistical test, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's not a great reason for not doing it, so I didn't list it, right? Like, whenever my students say, well, I'm going to have to do that by hand, I'm like, yeah, you are, right? Like, that's not a good reason. Yeah. Now, if, if we need to get this thesis submitted by next week or you're not going to be able to defend it, but, okay, then let's find a way, let's find an argument that isn't just, I didn't have time. <laughs> but um, but it's true. I mean that that was part of it for me because it had already been sitting with them for five months. Um, I and it was term, so it was it, it would have meant another five months turnaround on my side that I just didn't have. I wanted it published. <laughs> Rightfully so. <laughs> anybody, anybody? Anybody want to ask me anything? I've got a question. Great. Okay, so um, it's not really related to like the core. It's more of an aside thing. Uh, but I was wondering about the rise in the quota to think over yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, well, to a certain point. And yeah. I was wondering um, if in the earlier data sets, did people not refer to their own thoughts? Or did they do it in a different way so they could still use say? Like, does, does it reflect... No, I said to myself. Yeah. Okay. Right? I mean, that's the only... If it was... Th the only way it, to tell in that early stuff, if they were... If it was thought and they were using say, was to put that to myself. Uh, and, in fact, you still get that today, right? So to disambiguate say out loud, because it, it is it is a, um, a speech verb, you have to put that to myself on it. That um, shows up. You can see there's only 35 in the whole data set, say in the mobile unit, there's only 35 overtly specified addresses. I'm pretty sure they're all, you know, well, yeah, 94% of those are stuck on say, right? So um, they really just, they really weren't quoting thought, and it didn't matter if it was theirs or anyone else's. That internal stuff didn't come out through direct quotation. I'm not saying you could never quote yourself. I'm saying you didn't do it directly. Because there's a lot of other ways you can do it, right? There's a lot of um, epistemic resources in the language. And in fact, Isa Buchstaller, she had a book come out last year um, on quotatives um, where she says, she says, no, we always did quote thought, we just did it differently, right? So we didn't use direct quotation. So maybe it was via indirect, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I was thinking that maybe I should go over there, or I was thinking I should ask him if he wanted help, which is, it's you're still quoting your, your internal thought processes, you just aren't doing it in a direct quotation format. Yeah. So our ability to quote ourselves isn't new. It's just that, that we do it directly is. Which is cool, right? I mean, why, why should that have changed? I don't know. Oh, yeah, well, 
what 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 does cause this expansion of or even even the, the competition between forms so they you see on uh, page 361 the nice graph at the mm -hmm. bottom or shows the, the uh, increase in the number of uh, of, of competitive or co uh, competing variables that people use, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, what? So I think did you say at some point this this is driven by pragmatic uh, concerns or pragmatic need, functional need? That's what I think. Yeah. I mean. I think that I think that it became more and more in vogue, you know, more and more acceptable to talk about yourself. It, right. You certainly see a shift. I mean, we talk about colloquialization, and I think, in a sense, um, being able to talk about yourself is a reflection of of that. Um, and people from different fields have noted that that's been increasing more over the last century and a half anyways. It's usually discussed in, you know, as an American thing, but I think that the fact that you see the, this increasing ability to, to directly quote inner thought and attitude, you don't just get it in these New Zealand materials. You get it in um, British data, you get it in um, the stuff that we've looked at so far in my Canadian data, it's there too. Sally and I had it in Toronto. It's in the Australian data that I've been working with with a woman um, in Perth. So I, I think it's it's a broader tendency, and I think it could be considered part of that overall trajectory toward colloquialization. You know, it's 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 more okay to have an opinion and to share it. Before right. it was you were expected to keep those things to yourself. Like the rise of the ego, the rise of uh, focus on the individual. Yeah. Uh, compared to the, the group. Um, so how, how how young were the youngest speakers in the in any of the corpora? So I'm asking because I'm I'm interested in in hearing about how uh, the preteens in your from your MA thesis uh, work uh, compared to say uh, senior citizens or older adults. Do we have different uh, quoting styles? Yeah. Um, yeah, but now how much of that is generational? And how much of that is change? That I really don't know. So let me think about this. So the youngest speakers in the mobile unit uh, were probably in their 60s. Okay, all right. Right, like they were, they were an older group. Um, let me figure this out. So the youngest speakers in the ONSI sample that I used here were in their 20s. The, the part of the issue with that corpus is that in the Canterbury corpus, so it's a monitor corpus, right? So every year they're going out, they're doing more interviews, they're adding um, data to the to the corpus, but the sampling protocol is set, right? So you're doing 18 to 24, I think it is, and then you're doing 50 to 65. Those are the target speakers. Now sometimes people hit outside the target, but you're not getting a huge chunk of, right, like those people are rare. So once in all you might get a 16 year old or you might get a 15 year old, but you're not getting really, really youngies. But from from our own data here, I mean, one of the things we noticed when we were working on the Perth data, we talk about a big data set, like that one's massive because we've got comparable data from um, New Zealand, uh, Australia, Canada and England, so that that one's huge, right? Like we're talking twenty thousand tokens of quotation, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, but we noticed a big difference even between speakers born in the first half of the nineteen nineties and born in the second half of the nineteen nineties. Oh, interesting. Right. So, because we had all the nineteen nineties together, and something wasn't, like we could just tell that something was off. So we started cutting it in different places, and and it was like nineteen ninety four turned out to be a really meaningful year for whatever reason for Australia anyway for Western Australia so um, so what we need now right are real-time studies because we need to know what happens to speakers age and I know that Sally Tagliamonte and Suzanne Evans Wagner are are looking at real-time data from a few of the same speakers to see what happens as you get older um, I know for me though the, I mean, the older I get the more be like I use 
I, I, when I actually use say or go, I notice it. Because mm -hmm. it's exceptional for me. It's very marked. Yeah, and that wasn't always the case. Mm. So, well, then again, I'm, I'm cool, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm not young at heart, so I'm <laughs> friends. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but there's a huge difference. I mean, you can tell. Just listen. You don't even have to know anything about the speakers, but if you look at the, the data from an older speaker and the data from a younger speaker, you just know without, without having been shown speaker information, you can roughly gauge them. For sure, yeah. yeah. So on the on the uh, topic, and maybe this we can uh, close on this note. Um, the 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 current research you're doing um, is anything new happening? Are there any any new changes that are? Um, is there an expansion of the the quotative system in, in another in another way? Uh, I will. I want to say no, but you know what? Uh, the the truer answer is I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, and frankly, that's because in this newer work, we're focusing on um, on explaining explaining just. I hope no one's offended by this, but I, we're trying to uh, explain just what the hell is going on, because be like is. Weird. Really, if we step back and think about it, be like makes no sense. It defies everything we know about language change in the sense that A, it went from zero to like 90, literally, in 35 years. That's unprecedented in terms of rate of change. And it went global at the exact same time, right? So people will say, well, you didn't really get be like outside of the US before the end of the 90s. Wrong. Right. That's wrong. And when we look in our data sets and we start paying attention to where the major um, breakpoints are in the data, it's it's the first users around the world were all born in the 1960s. All of them. And it's it doesn't and then it's like okay were you born in 1970 to 74 and if you were you were the generation that first pushed this thing and it didn't matter if you were in North America or Australia and that's that's weird right like that it shouldn't look like that sure and, and one of the interesting things you can um, it's it's not restricted to just the being introduced at the younger generation, sixty-year-olds, seventy-year-olds can can just decide one day to start using it too. Yeah, they can pick it up too. So it's got it's. I mean, it's got a lot of really weird things. I also don't think it's grammaticalization. I, uh, you know, the more, I just finished writing um, a paper on that actually, where I I, I think grammaticalization is the wrong. I think we're just looking at it completely the wrong way. It's not a grammatical form, so we need to rethink what we're doing with it, uh, and we really need to examine the syntax more carefully. Because it's not a lexical variable, but it's it's not a syntactic variable, it's somewhere it's somewhere else. So, um, it, I mean, it's confounding on a number of levels, um, and I think that we just sort of, we, we don't think about those things so much because we're so focused on, well, it's this super awesome new thing and everybody uses it, and are we all doing the same thing, and oh, look at that, it's, it has the same constraints in uh, York as it does in Christchurch. Oh, that's that's really awesome. Yeah, but why? That's weird, right? Like every time we sort of break it down to its elements, we had a big Skype with um, Anthony Warner at the University of York, and we sort of started to lay out the different things. And he said, "You guys, like that. I need you to stop and think. Like this is not normal." Right. So that's we're kind of focusing now on its non-normal things and trying to figure out how do we embed this given our understanding of language and historical language change, you know, what do we think? So that's really where the newer work is going as opposed to is it still do doing things? But I, mean, I, I, I am hearing new things, well, because like Paul, I'm on a playground a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. And so you hear the thing kids are doing and my son can do things with be like that I can't. So I mean, it is continuing to develop. So it's it's 
it's it's not it ain't done yet. That's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Could you give us an example of something your son could do that you couldn't? Yeah. So um, I so I can do. I can't question a direct quote with be like. Mm. So I can't say like I can say what did you say or he went what I can do that, um, but I can't say he was like what, but mm. my son can. Mm. And he's done it to me a few times, right? So I remember once I was saying, um, um, he asked me, and I was like, huh? <laughs> and my son said, what were you like? Yeah, that, that was the question. So he, he can, he's perfectly fine with saying, what was he like? Meaning, yeah. Okay. What did he say? He can, he can do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What did he quote? Like, what was the content? Whereas that, for me, is just... Out of bounds, right? Yeah. And and it, it is actually pushing now. It's expanding. You see all these new tense and aspectual things starting to happen to it, which we'd expect, right? The more embedded it becomes. So it used to be really limited to past tense morphology and present tense morphology, regardless of temporal reference. But now you're getting progressives and you're getting modals and you're getting you're getting all kinds of new things going on there too. So those are those are two things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, we're just about out of time, so um, uh, if anyone ha wants to sneak in a question before we before we uh, log out here, uh, we're welcome to do that. I, I just have a question. Um, have you seen if uh, the light is also used on the internet? If it, sorry, I missed your question. If it, if the B light. Is also used on the internet. On the internet. Mm -hmm. Like in, in, in written text, written, uh, te maybe online posts or uh, yeah. text messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've definitely seen it. Yeah, online. I mean, not as frequently as Go, um, but that I think that is more about the fact that like, like is confused. Quotative like is confused with all those other likes, and so it, it, it carries some of that baggage as soon as you start to write it down. Um, but it's de I've definitely seen it. I've seen it on forums. I've seen it um, in chat. I've seen it in comments, like at, at the bottom of a feed, which I, I actually try to avoid. So there's probably a lot of them places like that, but I, don't, I, I tend to ignore the comments. <clears throat> but I have seen it in places like that. Do you text yourself? Uh, no. no. <laughs> so you're not, you're not an active user of like in text messages. Though. In text, no. I'll do, I'll, I do it with email though, quite regularly. No, I don't have a cell phone. Don't judge me. I don't have a cell phone, so I don't text. No, I think that there's two people on the surf that don't have cell phones that do text messages there. So that that, that makes you and I. Oh, great. Yeah. I knew I liked you. In that sense. Okay, well, thanks, Alex. Uh, it was great chatting with you. Happy to happy to be here. If anybody thinks of anything else, you can drop me an email anytime. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so fun. we will. Uh, we look forward to chatting with you again in the future, and maybe you can sit down one of the the reading groups that is coming up in the next couple of weeks too. Yeah, there's some really good ones coming. You guys are lucky. This is a great idea for sure. For sure. Let me know if I have anything else you're interested in. This, I'm happy to do this anytime. Yeah, okay. We're happy to have you back. Okay, cool. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Thanks. See you still later. There? Okay, see you, Laura. Yeah.